Okay, so you tell me first what kind of reaction is the first one. It's a synthesis reaction. Everybody got that. All right, so it's a synthesis reaction. So two reactants making one product. What's the second one? Single displacement. So see that I have two reactants, two products. So remember, if they're the same, then it's going to be a displacement type or a combustion. But this one is a single displacement. I have an element in a compound making a different element in compound. So I'll just put SD, that's single displacement. So what's the next one? It's another single displacement. Okay, element plus a compound making a different element in compound. Then the fourth synthesis. And then the last one is a synthesis as well. Okay, so those, if it's a synthesis, then look, it's going to be an ionic formation. So look for the metal, the metal gets oxidized. Look for the non-metal, the non-metal gets reduced. So in this one, what gets oxidized? Magnesium. Remember that the metal's on the left of the zigzag line, so you can identify by just looking at the periodic table, so you know that this is oxidized. So then not, nitrogen is a non-metal, so you know that it is reduced. Because the they lose electrons. Okay. Mm -hmm. Loss of electrons is oxidation. So LEO, losing electrons is oxidation, so they're oxidized. So then single displacement is going to be one of the swapping. So you got to figure out what gets swapped in this reaction. Does hydrogen get swapped or does oxygen get swapped? So look at the beginning. So see chlorine's all by itself, but then as a product, chlorine is now with. So look at, look at the reactants. So I have chlorine and I have water. So I have both hydrogen and oxygen. So what does the chlorine end up with as a product? See, it ends up as, so if you look at the element, see that the chlorine, go back, go forward. The chlorine ends up gaining hydrogen. Okay, so the chlorine starts off all by itself and it ends up gaining a hydrogen. But if you look at water, it ends up being just oxygen by itself. So do you see that the water loses its, ox its hydrogen, but the chlorine gains? So if this gains hydrogen, the chlorine gains hydrogen, what happens to it? It's reduced. Whereas the water, because it ends up losing its hydrogen and just forms oxygen, so if it loses hydrogen, that's oxidation. Okay? So there is a swapping of hydrogen. So loss of hydrogen, loss of electrons, that's oxidation. Gain of hydrogen, gain of electrons, that's reduction. So hydrogen and electrons do the same thing. But oxygen is the backwards one. So if you gain oxygen, that's oxidation. So notice if you lose electrons or lose hydrogen, that's oxidation. But if you gain oxygen, that's oxidation. So it's not if you lose any of them, it's oxidation. There's actually different criteria. So then what about this next one? Oh, did I skip? I skipped one. So no wonder you were probably looking at me like I was a crazy person. Sorry. So in the next one, the second one, so calcium, what happens to calcium in this reaction? Mm -hmm. So if you follow the CA, see it becomes CAO. So you say, oh, that gains oxygen. So it is oxidized. And then if you look at H2O, what happens to it? It loses. So that means it is reduced. So this one's a swapping of oxygen. The second one is a swapping of hydrogen. Fourth one, SN plus Cl, what is this? What happens to SN? Uh-huh, so what, hap what is SN though? This is synthesis, so all you gotta do is identify which one is the metal. If it's a synthesis, it's always gonna be, it for, for us, this is not the, the case in all chemical reactions, but for us, if it's a synthesis reaction, it's going to be a metal and a non-metal. So what is SN, metal or a non-metal? 
metal, okay? So it's tin. You don't even have to know what it is, but you can find SN on the periodic table, right? So if you find SN, you see that it's to the left of the zigzag line. So you know it's a metal, so that means this is oxidized. Because it's a metal, it's going to lose its electrons. It's going to get oxidized. Whereas chlorine is a non-metal, so you know that it's going to gain electrons and it gets reduced. So the metal always gets oxidized. Non-metal gets reduced. What about the last one? Fe plus O2 makes Fe2O3. Iron is oxidized because iron is a metal to the left of the zigzag line. Oxygen is to the right of the zigzag line, so it is a non-metal and it gets reduced. Okay, so there's one more at the end of this chapter that we'll practice next time, but just go through the little chart that I did is really the exact same thing as this. Like this is a good, this slide itself is sort of a good summary, an example of what happens. So this is one that I would say go back over. And also remember, like the blank PowerPoints are all posted in Moodle. So in theory, you could download the blank PowerPoints and go through and practice and see how many of these you can do. The answers are on the marked up PowerPoints and hopefully in your notes. So you could actually like have the two of them practice, check yourself, practice, check yourself. See if you can actually identify what gets oxidized, what gets reduced. And then the answers, I sort of wrote them out so that you can pick them out. So hopefully that kind of helps just feel like, okay, I think I can figure this out from... Just synthesis, combustion, and then those single displacement reactions. Those are really the three different kinds of reactions where oxidation and reduction can be identified. Not all reactions are oxidation and reduction, okay? They have to be where you're swapping electrons or hydrogen or oxygen between reactants in that reaction. All right, so now we're moving on to the common organic reaction types. So there's four. Okay, so this is like the end of this chapter. Four common reactions. Two are part, are kind of like the opposite of each other. Kind of like where oxygen is gaining, reduction is losing. Same thing here. If, but we're talking in this, the forward reaction is going to be one of these. The reverse reaction would be the opposite. Condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions. So it really just depends on what happens as to whether they're one or the other. A condensation reaction, ways that you can pick these out, condensation reactions always form water. Water will be a product. So one of the criteria, water is a product. You form water in this reaction by pulling hydrogen off of one molecule and an alcohol group off of the other. So H and OH makes H2O. So hydrogen comes off of one molecule, alcohol off of the other molecule. When they combine, you get H and OH to make the H2O. So that is why water is a product. So they just show you this is like kind of the generic, like A plus B makes C. This is sort of a generic condensation. So the yellow circles would be could be any kind of molecule. It could be lots of carbons. It could be just one carbon. But any kind of molecules, if you can pull an alcohol group off of one, a hydrogen off the other, now, because by pulling groups off, that creates the bond between those two, linking them together. So I think of condensation reactions as really helping to build molecules. Can you see where you could have like building blocks? And now they're going to get linked, and then they're going to get linked, and then they're going to get linked. So condensation helps to form things like polymers. It helps to form chains of molecules like polysaccharides, like proteins, nucleic acids. Condensations are the typical way that your cells build larger molecules from building blocks. Okay? But that's one of the kickers that you can see is water is going to be a product because water is not a product in any of the other three. So if you see water is a product on the right side of the reaction, then you can be pretty safe going, oh, that's condensation. The opposite direction, though. So in the opposite direction, we're going to use water to break a molecule. So if we have a really big molecule and we want to break it into little pieces, we do hydrolysis. So hydrolysis 
water is going to be used to split a molecule into two. So if we look at this one going this direction, the reverse, so you see that you have like the two yellow structures connected. And so we're going to add, breaking this bond, add hydrogen to the oxygen that's in the middle and add an alcohol to the other yellow structure so that they can both be stable and separate. So in hydrolysis, this is really how you break large molecules down like what you do in digestion. So if you like eat starchy food, it has to get digested all the way down to sugars to absorb. Hydrolysis is how it happens. So you have enzymes along your GI tract that help to speed this process up, but all they're doing is hydrolysis reactions. They're like taking water, breaking the bond, taking water, breaking the bond. And by breaking it, remember if you break a bond, you've got to, st carbon still has to have four covalent bonds. So by adding that hydrogen onto the oxygen, it's stable. By adding the alcohol group to the other side of the bond, that bond becomes stable as well. So in this, hydrolysis, water is going to be a reactant. Problem is, is there's another reaction example where water is a reactant. <laughs> so you have to like pick this out. So think of this. It'll look like something that was together now looks like it's split. And you'll see like an H and an OH on either end. Okay? Condensation is how you build molecules like proteins, how you build and store stuff like glycogen, how you would build polysaccharides if you were a plant. We don't really do that. Okay? So an example. So an example of a hydrolysis and condensation, see the reaction has the arrow goes both directions. Remember, so that means that it's reversible. Your cell uses this universal energy molecule, ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So triphosphate, do you see three phosphates over on the left? All right, so you see there's one, two, three. That's where the triphosphate comes from. The adenosine, this is an adenine, so you don't have to know the structure of it, but that's, it's got like, it's got this base, it's got a sugar, and then it's got those phosphates. But it is really this phosphate right here that is actually holds a large amount of energy when your cells want to do things like build, grow, make proteins, whatever it's trying to form, it can do hydrolysis by breaking off that, out, that outer phosphate. When it does that, it releases energy. And that energy is then used to power whatever's going on. Okay? So remember, hydrolysis is when you break things, when you break bonds, you typically release energy. Well, ATP has a lot of energy in that outer phosphate. So snapping it off generates a lot of energy so that the cell can do whatever it needs to. But in the same point, when you break down nutrient molecules, then you may generate energy that you can then use to power the condensation reaction. So when you break down or do combustion inside of the cell, so we actually break down sugars, making carbon dioxide and water, there's energy that's released. That energy can get trapped or used to be able to synthesize ATP, and then that's sitting in the cell for the cell to be able to use. So we have this both back and forth that ends up occurring. If the cell needs to use energy, it breaks down ATP. If there's lots of nutrients available, the cell can break them down and generate ATP so that you can power those unfavorable reactions, like building. So this brings us into like an example of a hydrolysis reaction that happens with our first nutrient groups. We haven't really talked about the nutrients, lipids, proteins, um, carbohydrates. So this was actually originated in chapter four. I don't really like how they split it into two, set, two chapters. I just feel like they should just cover it all in one, right? It just like makes more sense to just talk about it at one time. So I just take it and like shove it into chapter five. So these are lipids. So when you think about lipids, lipids are anything that is falls into the category of being an oil or being a fat. So lipids are made of these building blocks that are called fatty acids. 
The reason they're called fatty acids is because they are made of long carbon chains, anywhere from 12 to 22 carbon atoms. So I would have to have, just to do 12, I would have CH3, CH2, 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 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, CH2, CH2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, CH2, C, double bond O, OH, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. That's the smallest, okay? So that's a fatty acid chain. So I made a couple just for you to see. This is a 16 carbon, okay? So this is just your typical building block of a fat. So they're really big. Okay, a lot bigger than water, a lot bigger than most of the other organic molecules like the hexanes and the pentanes that we talked about. So this is 16. So we didn't even really get into the naming parts of those. We're just saying like that's a really big, long molecule. On the end of the molecule is that C double bond O, OH. That is the carboxylic acid. So that is the reason that it's called a fatty acid is because of the carboxylic acid on the end is the reason that they called it that. And they called it fatty because really long chains of carbon are greasy, oily, okay, fats and oils. So that's where that name kind of evolved. Most fatty acids are anywhere from 12 to 22. I didn't want to do 22 because that's just way too many. So I got 16 in my molecule. There's only 12 right there. If... They're like this one where it's all single bonds. So notice every carbon in the middle is a CH2. So that means between every carbon is a single bond. They call that a saturated fatty acid. So that's really like the one that I held up. When you look at it, you can see that there's single bonds between every single carbon. So it forms that like nice zigzag. You see where the skeletal structure really kind of like fits. That would be really easy just to do the nice little zigzags with this one and not have to draw all those carbons like and hydrogens out. It's just nice just to do the little zigzags. So they look like that. So the one that I drew is lauric acid. But then this one, so this is palmitic acid, the one that is the saturated 16 carbon. And notice, so remember, every end in every corner would be a carbon. All those carbons have hydrogens, but when they do the skeletal structure, they don't draw them. The only thing they do draw is they do put in that um, carboxylic acid group on the far end. That carbon with the double bond oxygen and the OH, that's a carboxylic acid group. So these are called, it says this, but that's wrong. I really have to go back and fix that. These are saturated. Saturated is all single bonds between carbons. So notice also, it's always an even number. You never have like 13 carbons or 15 carbons. It's always like 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. So they're always even numbers. But then there's also the potential of having double bonds. If you have mono unsaturated, that means you have how many? One, right? Mono means one. So if it is mono unsaturated, because the word looks really small over there. Monounsaturated means one double bond somewhere in the molecule. So, yeah, I know. So these are un. Yes. And, and, I, and I know that I have seen this multiple times and said, I really have to fix that. And I keep not fixing it. Mono and poly, anything unsaturated means there's a, at least one double bond. And so mono and saturated, just one. But if you have more than one, then they just call it poly. So they don't say diunsaturated, triunsaturated. They just say more than one is considered a polyunsaturated. So the next time that you look at your butter, Crisco, if you look at um, olive oil, cooking oil, if you look at the label, it'll actually tell you like saturated fats, unsaturated fats. It'll split it down now. So they have expanded sort of the nutritional content to see so that you can get an idea about the amounts of them. 
So there's palmitoleic, palmitoleic acid and oleic acid. So I actually have one of these. 16. This one's the 16. This is palmitoleic acid. So there's the double bond. Do you see it? Do you see like the two lines? Remember the double bond has like the two bendy, the two bendy grade links that hold together. Now, if you look at this, do you notice that this arrangement matches? So if you look at this double bond, do you see that the carbons that are attached sticking off both like stick up? Okay, does anybody remember what form that is? So when we were talking about ring structures or double bonds, I told you that you don't get free rotation. Because if I keep doing this, but if you take this, right, remember single bonds? Single bonds, you can rotate. Things can like twist around. So there's a lot of movement when you have single bonds. They just draw it as a zigzag because it's so much more easy. Like it's so much more convenient to do the zigzag. But when I get the double bond, what does that mean? They all move, right? So see if I take this and try to twist it. I don't get any rotation like I can with the single bonds. This is stuck. And so this creates a stereoisomer type. Does anybody remember what this is? They're both sticking up or both sticking down. That would be cis, right? Cis means that the bonds are like stuck on the same side. So see how both of the carbons stick down or both of the carbons stick up? That you don't have one sticking up and one sticking down. So that is cis. And they found in nature, notice all of the examples here, they all have that. So when you see this double bond like this, that's showing that all the bonds end up in that cis conformation and they don't freely rotate. All unsaturated fats, fatty acids exist in the cis conformation in nature. So there is no known trans double bonds in nature. So the polyunsaturated. So notice in the polyunsaturated, so there's like linoleic, alpha linoleic. So those have more than one. So typically you'll have a double bond and then you'll have a, two single bonds and another double bond, then two single bonds and then another. So notice they're kind of evenly spread out across the, the long chain. Two of these, linoleic and alpha linoleic, you actually need in your diet. So they are considered essential fatty acids. So you need these to be able to do the functions that, that fats and oils do. But honestly, it's very rare that you actually end up being depleted or low in fatty acids because this is found in soybean, safflower, corn, flaxseed, canola oil. Okay? So pretty much if you eat bread, <laughs> if you eat anything that's got any kind of oil in it, you get plenty. So it's pretty rare that people actually have a nutritional deficiency of these fatty acids, but they typically are actually considered essential because you don't make them in your body, you've got to get them in your diet. So what do fats and oils do? So why do you have to have fatty acids at all? So these are really the big jobs. When you ingest fats and oils, you can use these to build membranes. So membranes, like your cell membrane, like the membranes that make your mitochondria, the covers, Membranes for all those organelles in the cells, so things like your endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, all those have a little cover. Those are membranes. So to be able to create this kind of enclosure or compartments within the cell, that's what you need to have fatty acids for. They're also really important insulators. They're insulators. They produce myelin on nerve fibers. So tell me, what does myelin do for a nerve impulse? Yes, myelin's in the brain. Myelin actually coats nerve fibers, and it does what? Transmits what? What? Nerve impulses, faster or slower? Faster, okay? And so you have really fast nerve impulses if there's a lot of myelin. So I always think of myelin as being it like kind of like covers little sections of the axon, so that nerve impulses just skip over those areas. Instead of having to interact with the entire surface of the nerve fiber, it can just hop over them. And that can send nerve impulses at speeds of like 100 meters per second. So like a football field in a second. Without myelin, 
you can only send nerve impulses about one meter per second. And people go, well, well, 1,000. Well, that's not too slow. <laughs> well, 1,000. We're not that tall. Like, how, you know, how bad would that be? The problem is, is important, highly myelinated nerve fibers are used in things like posture, right? So you may not, un you may not even realize it, but you constantly have muscles in your legs, in your back, in your torso that are contracting and relaxing to maintain your balance. So if those are slowed, then you're going to end up having this sort of uncoordinated sensation. This is what happens with patients that have multiple sclerosis. So MS is an autoimmune disorder where myelin is destroyed from those nerve fibers. So the nerve impulses get slower and slower and slower. And so they have fall risks, okay? So they're kind of unsteady. Their gait, their balance becomes off. Another important function that, that myelin is used for is when you're eating and you don't even think about it, okay? Like, it's kind of fun if you watch like babies learning to eat because they do this all the time. Like they get too much in their food, too much food or the food's in the wrong spot in their mouth. And so it gets to a spot and they're like, uh, uh, like they like have this look like, they look like, well, I can't swallow. Like their little bodies are literally learning how to coordinate that. So hopefully by the time you're a grown-up and you figured it out, that doesn't happen very much. Except when like milk comes out your nose for some random reason when you laugh. But other than that, the people that have MS, if they lose that myelin, then their swallowing reflex is slowed. So food gets going normally. Your tongue pushes food up against your hard palate, pushes it back to the soft palate, which then rises. And then you have throat constrictor muscles that squeeze and push food into the back of your throat and then divert it into your esophagus. At the same time, your little epiglottis covers over the opening to your airways so that food doesn't go down in the trachea, it gets pushed back into the esophagus. Well, if you lose coordination of those steps, then food could get like hung up. It could get stuck, the epiglottis might not stay down, and so you're, you have a choking risk. So there's a lot of things that like these nerve fibers and this, the insulators that come into play are really important in order to allow for really rapid nerve impulses. So when someone has a stroke, is it, is it put in that hospital? It's usually not affecting the amount of myelin. When you have a stroke, you're affecting the pathway. So you've like damaged something in the brain. So what used to go in your brain, like, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it. Okay, now I've got to stimulate these muscles to do it. You're losing the pathway, and so that stops. So now you get to hear, and nothing happens, right? So people may have, like, speech issues because that's one of the most complicated things that you can do is actually speech just because it requires so much control of respiratory muscles, mouth muscles, tongue muscles, like the whole, the whole nine yards comes into play. It's extremely complicated, and that's, like, one of the biggest difficulties people have post-stroke is trying to like regain functional speech. So it's not loss of myelin, it's actually damage to whole neuron sections that affect the pathway. And there's nothing that can like do to like get Depends on the amount of damage. So if you have a very large area damaged in the brain because of loss of oxygen or a blood vessel blows or something like that, then you may not. Like that person like may have loss of that function forever. But depending on the amount of damage if, with physical therapy, you can actually retrain the brain to like bypass the damaged area. And so that's like why you have your occupational therapist, the speech therapist, because like this area is damaged and it can't go past here, but now it'll learn a pathway to literally like go around the blockage or go around the damaged area, which is really cool. Like, cause I've had a friend that had a stroke and like, I couldn't understand anything that he was saying. Like, and then about nine months later, I was like, wow, his speech has really become so much more distinct. And then within about 18 months, like you could almost, there were certain words, but most words, you really couldn't tell. But it was all because he had like been working and working and doing like speech therapy, trying to regain. And so your brain's pretty elastic. It's got an ability to do things. But if you lose myelin because of an autoimmune disorder, that's where it's just lost. So it's not that you lose the nerves, you just lose the speed. So it's not passing as fast as it should. So your internal organs. So think about like your heart, your liver, your lungs, your kidneys, GI tract. So you actually have fat 
that kind of like covers these organs. And this actually acts as a protection. So I always think of like the kidneys, especially when I watch those ultimate fighting things. I really can't stand to watch it. I just don't like watching people punch each other, okay? But their, your kidneys are actually embedded in the back wall of your abdominal pelvic cavity, and you have like a little fatty cover. And that's kind of like a cushion for jarring motions, for forceful side blows. And so, you know, when they're like kicking each other, I'm like, they're going to be <laughs> peeing blood tonight. I just know it. <laughs> okay. Because there's only but so much cushioning that, that, that this fat can do, but it is present there and it's actually beneficial. Then of course we store fat underneath the skin. And so that can act as an insulator. Okay. So that can help to slow down heat loss. The last one, though, energy reserve. You can burn fatty acids for energy. We'll talk about this in a, the metabolism chapter. The drawback of this is when you burn a lot of fats, there's more waste molecules that your kidneys have to handle. So you got to make sure that you're like, if you're like really on some of the, the keto diets that are really popular now, the ones, the important thing is the amount of water that you intake while you're on any of those types of eating ways of eating, a lot of people call them, okay, because you can burn this for energy, but you're putting a lot more pressure on your kidneys. So your kidneys are going to have to flush out a lot of the waste from the byproducts of fat metabolism. You can use this. Remember, you get nine calories per gram from fats compared to carbohydrates, only four, or proteins, only four. You can get more energy per gram from a fat, but there's always a byproduct Whereas when you burn carbohydrates, you make carbon dioxide in water. Carbon dioxide, you exhale. Water just becomes part of the water in the cell. So those products are very easy to get rid of. But with the any, burning any kind of fats, the benefit that you can store fats, because remember, fats don't mix with water. So in your little fat cells, the little adipose tissue, your little adipocytes that live in your fat tissue, you can actually pack fat into those cells without water. So they're actually, they can be packed in really tightly. So that's a benefit and why like bears, you know, they like go and they like gorge themselves in the fall. They eat as much as they possibly can and they get a high fat store because then they go sleep all winter and they like burn that fat while they're sleeping. And it's really beneficial, better than a carbohydrate, which needs water around it. These don't have to have water. So fat molecules can get packed and stored in a much smaller space than any other nutrient because they're nonpolar. They don't mix with water, okay? So those are major functions of fat, fatty acids in general. But now if you look at different foods, you see that like you don't have just one kind of fatty acid in a, in a fat or oil source. So looking at this, the blue is saturated. So saturated means what? Single bonds, right? So saturated means all the carbon to carbon bonds are single. Monounsaturated means we only have one double bond in the chain. That's monounsaturated. Poly means two or more. Okay, I'll just put more than one. So looking at this, where's your animal sources? Lard, because that comes from pigs, and butter. That comes from cows. So you would say that these have a higher percent of what? They have a higher saturated. Doesn't mean they don't have any unsaturated. They have some, but the relative, they have more blue than they have red and green. So they have a higher saturated fat content Whereas when we look at all the oils, soybean, olive oil, sunflower, corn oil, canola oil, see how low the saturated fat content is? So they're really more a combination of some kind of unsaturated. So what's the difference? Or is it not really like that? Depends on what you're doing. Like for cooking, there's some, there's some that you can heat hotter. You can get them hotter like for, for like, like stir frying and stuff compared so some of it has to do with their 
unsaturated versus polyunsaturated content like olive oil. You can heat olive oil hotter than you can like canola. Okay, but look at the difference. So olive oil has a little bit more monounsaturated. So it has this ability to be heated at a little bit higher temperature before it starts that smoking. I don't know if you've ever heated grease and then you're like, it's smoking. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, next comes flames, turn it down, turn it down. Right, so olive oil is one that you can actually get pretty high. Whereas soybean and corn, you can't. They, they're like 10, 15 degrees cooler. They start smoking at a lower temperature. So it really depends on what you're talking about doing. Okay, so these are all plants, right? So soybean, olive, sunflower, corn, canola. And notice these have, plants typically have a higher unsaturated content. Then there's always people that say, well, what about, what's up with coconut and palm? <laughs> coconut and palm are called tropical oils. Where do these typically grow? Mm -hmm. The tropical oils, they like to grow in like Hawaii. <laughs> they like to grow close to the equator. Okay, so they grow in really warm climates, so it typically doesn't get much below 80 in those areas. It stays hot all the time. They have a high saturated fat content, but at 80 degrees, coconut and palm oil are liquid. Now, in my kitchen, does anybody have coconut oil at their house, right? What is it, solid or liquid? Solid. It's a solid, right? It's a white solid. It's nice and creamy. Right? It's not super hard, but it is still a solid, and it's a plant oil. So that always kind of throws people, because you think of an oil as being a liquid, but then you get it, and you're like, but this is a solid. Why do they, why do they call it coconut fat? Well, they always call fats. They always attributed those more to animal products, whereas oils are, contrib are attributed to plant. So tropical oils would be liquid at higher temperatures, but in our case, they end up looking solid. So this all comes into play. The reason that you think of oils as liquid and fats as solid really is based on their saturation. So if you look at a saturated fat like this one, right? So remember that this one is all those single bonds. Yeah, I messed up my zigzag. Right? So they have this like perfect little zigzag. So if I had a hundred of these molecules, I think of these as looking kind of like, like if I'm thinking about kitchen utensils, Saturated fatty acids are like a knife, right? So see how they make kind of like a straight molecule? So you know like when you pull a bunch of knives out of the dishwasher and throw them in the drawer, they all line up perfect, right? So all your, unless you have weird knives, but most people's <laughs> knives are kind of like, no, I mean there's some weird knives with weird handles on them, but most knives are just straight. So you can take all these knives and they sit like right next, like toothpicks. They sit all right next to each other. These can pack in really close. And that's why they're solid at room temperature, right? Remember we said solids have to get real close together. But what happens when we add this? When we add this double bond, the molecule looks like this. Because see how the double bond creates a bend? So I think of unsaturated, this is like forks, right? So you pull forks out of the dishwasher, unless you're one of those people that lines them all up. I never onto that. But if you just pull all your forks out of the dishwasher, throw them in the fork, compartment, what happens? Do they all fit? No, they're all like fall into the knife container. So mine like all stick out, right? They don't pack in tight. That is because they have a bend, right? Forks have a little bit of a bend to them. And so this does too. So when you have a double bond and they're always cis, cis double bonds creates a bend in the molecule. So you can't make this a straight line. So this means when I have two of these, they can't fit up close to each other so they kind of like, this is my little cartoon. So here's one and here's the other. So they don't like fit close in. They can't get tight close in together. They can't become solid at room temperature. So that's why they're liquid. So all your vegetable oils, because they've got this double bond, that inhibits them from packing in tightly. That's why they're liquid at room temperature. Now, coconut oil and palm oil, they're solid at room temperature which makes sense because look at how much saturated fatty acid they have. They have more of these, okay? So their structure is more like lard and like butter. They have more of the saturated fatty acid, so that is why they're solid at room temperature. Even though they're an oil, they're solid at room temperature because they've got all those single bonds. So that makes this nice straight chain, and all those chains can pack in together easily. 
And that's why they are able to become solid. So now here's, when you eat fats or oils, you typically aren't eating just a fatty acid. So you're not eating just this one chain. In fact, fats and oils typically are formed into what are called triglycerides. So tri means three. So this is a really big molecule that has three fatty acids on it. So can you see like there's one, two, three? In fact, in this example, there's a polyunsaturated, a monounsaturated, and a saturated fatty acids all linked together. But because of those unsaturated chains, this is going to be an oil. Okay? If you see a double bond, it's going to be a liquid at room temperature, typically, because of that funny bend. See how I like the middle one. They tried to make it more of a bend. The top one's actually even more bent, but then you wouldn't have room on the page. So every time you have a double bond, you're going to get a bend. So polyunsaturated actually forms multiple bends. And so you end up with this sort of like curved looking chain. So that's a triglyceride. So just remember, it just means there's three long fatty acid chains. And they're held together. So the linker is called glycerol. So it's just the linker that holds those fatty acids together. When you eat, whether you're eating butter or if you're eating lard, like in a biscuit, it's delicious. Or if you're like having like olive oil, if you're going super healthy, <laughs> you're having some olive oil on a salad, then you're ingesting the triglyceride. So this is huge. You cannot absorb this. Instead, you have to digest it. And so that is a hydrolysis reaction. So remember I said hydrolysis is going to use water to split molecules. So it actually splits the fatty acids off of each other. They're still pretty big molecules, but they're not as big as a triglyceride. So in this, in digestion, this is a hydrolysis reaction. And remember that hydrolysis Water is a reactant. So you use water to break those fatty acids off of the glycerol chain. In fact, I kind of like this. They, they colored the water molecules red. So can you see when you look at the fatty acid chains at the bottom? See where the, the H and the OH are? So you end up with an H on the end of the, each glycerol, like the three, three oxygens off the glycerol. And then you have an OH making that carboxylic acid group on each of the fatty acid chains. That's hydrolysis. So we're taking something big and we're splitting it into smaller pieces. Those smaller pieces can get absorbed. We'll talk in chapter eight about what you have to do with them though, because you gotta emulsify them. You need bio in order to absorb them because these are still all nonpolar. They don't mix with water. So last two. Last two organic reactions. We talked about condensation. We talked about hydrolysis. Last two organic reactions are hydrogenation and hydration. Hydrogenation and hydration. And we're going to actually talk about fats and oils in reference to one of them. So that's why it kind of fits in. I know it seemed like we kind of stopped talking about reactions. Now we're back. But in this, both of these involve breaking a double bond. Okay? Hydrolysis and condensation do not. So if you see a double bond in the reaction, then you know it's either hydrolysis or hydration. If you don't see a double bond and water is used or water is made, that's high condensation or hydrolysis. Now, I will say it is a little disconcerting. It's a little challenging that we now have hydrolysis, hydration, and hydrogenation. It's a lot of H words. So part of that is just getting it straight. Okay, which one is which? What's hydrogenation doing? What's hydration doing? What's hydrolysis doing? Because they're all, it'd be nice if they had named them by different letters. It'd be easier to remember, but I didn't make the rules. Okay, so in this, we're going to split a double bond. We're going to take the double bond. Remember, it's reactive. Double bonds, squeezing extra electron pairs there creates a more reactive bond. We're going to make it more stable by breaking it. So we're going to convert a double bond to a single bond. And remember, carbon always, have to have, always has to have four bonds. So when we break that double bond, that means that each carbon on the other side of the double bond has to have something added to each one. So we're going to have to convert or add a molecule to each side. If it's hydrogenation, we are going to add hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So hydrogenation. 
We're adding hydrogen to the double bond. So that is this one. Really irritates me. That should not be here. Hydrogen is a reactant. So hydrogen does not belong above the arrow. Hydrogen should be on the reactant side. But what you'll see is there's a double bond plus hydrogen. And then you'll have just a single bond. So do you see that one hydrogen is added to each carbon? So when we break this, we've got to add because we still have to have four bonds. So by breaking the double bond, you add hydrogen. So in this, do you see that we're taking something that's unsaturated and we're making it saturated? We're taking something with the double bond and we're converting it to something that's all single bonds now. So you could do this. In this example, at the very top, remember our triglyceride? So you could take a triglyceride and hydrogenate it by adding hydrogen to those double bonds. And notice in the very top fatty acid, those two double bonds get converted to single bonds. So now instead of having the little bends in them, now they're straight. We'll talk about that last, that last comment in a minute. So this really became kind of in use in the 1950s. They knew about this kind of a reaction, that you could do this. But in the 1950s, they said, okay, all along our primary fat source that's used in baking has been butter or it's been lard, okay? So if you like bake anything, like unless you're using something that requires oil, if you want to use anything that's a solid, you would use butter or you would use lard. So butter and lard are both from animal products, and so where, when you make butter, you actually chill milk. That creates the cream, like comes to the top. You skim the cream off and you churn that, and that's what makes butter. But there are still small amounts of protein in that butter, which means that it'll actually go bad faster. So butter has like more flavor than what you would find in a typical oil, but it has a shorter shelf life. So the interest was... One, after the end of World War II, they had a lot of leftover oil. They used to use canola oil and vegetable oil as a lubricant in machinery. Like, so during the war, like in tanks and then, you know, like guns and artillery stuff. So at the end, they're like, we got all this oil left over. So they said, oh, here's something we can do. We can actually take this oil and we can hydrogenate it. So if we take this oil and hydrogenate it, Hydrogenating it means we're going to add hydrogen. We're going to convert the unsaturated fatty acid into a saturated fatty acid. And in doing that, now something that was a liquid will now have all single bonds and it can become a solid. If we add a little bit of flavoring to it, it'll taste kind of like butter. And this was the development of margarine. That's what margarine is. Crisco. These in the 1950s, like anybody that baked... This was like the big commercial push was, you should cook with this. <laughs> you should use these. Crisco and margarine are, they're spreadable butter, right? And if you've ever had cold butter and toast, you know what I mean by it's not very spreadable. Really cold butter, you put it on your toast and you start to try to spread it and it tears your toast all to pieces. You're like, oh, I hate this. So like... Friends that use butter, they don't even put their butter in the, in the refrigerator. They just leave it out so that it stays soft enough. But you can actually put margarine in the refrigerator, pull it out, and it's soft. So you can spread it, and it melts pretty readily. So it's spreadable butter. If you go to the grocery store and look at the, the expiration date for the butter and look at expiration date for blue bonnet margarine, blue bonnet margarine will last 10 months to a year. Butter is only about three months, so a much longer shelf life. So they were like, oh, that's a benefit. It's spreadable. Oh, it has a much better, it has a longer shelf life. And it was cheap. I can remember when I was a kid, you could get sticks of margarine for a quarter. Like four sticks of margarine in a container was a quarter. <laughs> so you get, like, you get like four for a buck, right? <laughs> like tons of margarine. So it was really pretty inexpensive. They also, this is a commercial claim, it's healthier because it's not an animal product. Right? So if it's not an animal product, there's no cholesterol. Cholesterol is only made by animals. So all of this was like the push in the 50s and 60s. And like people were like, yes, this is so much better. We should all start cooking with Crisco and we should use margarine instead. And I can remember being a kid, well, 
My mother has always been like this health food nut, so she was like, I don't like this stuff. <laughs> it's not natural. <laughs> so we didn't have a whole lot of margin, but it was up to my father. Mm -hmm. We'd have that, and we'd have Kool-Aid. <laughs> not my mother. She was like, nope. <laughs> so everything was great through the 1960s and the 1970s. And then in the 1980s, they started doing studies. And they said, hmm, you know, when we hydrogenate these unsaturated fatty acids, there is the short step, the short way to do it. Most of, and this is sort of like, think like 99%, 99% of our fatty acid molecules get converted to a saturated fat. But about 1% of the time, we're actually taking the cis double bond, the bond double bond op opens like it's supposed to, but instead of adding hydrogen to it, it actually reforms. And when it reforms, it reforms as a trans bond. So this becomes what they called a trans fat. And so the question was, well, what's the problem with that? Well, here's the asterisk. There is no known enzyme that can break a trans carbon double bond. So then becomes the next question of, well, well if we're eating this, what happens to it? So they started doing studies. Well, where does it go? So this ends up increasing your circulating fat. This increases circulating what they call triglyceride numbers. And so increasing the amount of fat and cholesterol that circulates in the blood is all associated with an increase in heart disease. So this first study started coming out in the, in the 80s. In the 90s, Europe banned trans fats. The United States said, we're not ready to do that. <laughs> Because by then, a lot of your convenience foods had actually retooled their recipes to use Crisco and margarine. They stopped using butter. They didn't use lard. They went to Crisco and butter because shelf life. <coughs> so you could like make chocolate chip cook, you know, chips of cookies, package it in Pennsylvania, and you could ship it to California, and it could sit on the shelf for three months before someone bought it, and it would still stay fresh because of the shelf life. If you made it with butter, that's not an option. Okay? If you'd made it with butter, it would have gotten stale by the time it went to this, you know, destination. So it really increased the availability of the convenience foods. So people were like, well, what stuff has trans fats in it? So that picture, it won't let me zoom anymore. I apologize. But looking at that picture, squint real hard. Have you had any of that this week? What have you had? Have you had popcorn? Yep, I've had popcorn in the last two weeks, like microwave popcorn. I really need to get a popcorn popper, but I still use it. <laughs> what else? Mm -hmm. It's not butter. That would be margarine. Mm -hmm. Anybody have frozen pizza? That's on the list. Anybody had any t tub frostings? Like to bake for a cake, that's on the list. Those graham cracker crusts, that's the one, the little background one. Any like pre made cakes, little Debbie's, okay? Those were all on the list. Cookies on the list as well. So, have you had any of those Pillsbury biscuits in the tube? Okay, those were on the list. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, these were the things. So, this is where the pushback came. So food manufacturers were like, we can't be ready. We can't get rid of it in 2000. No, no, we need more time. So they kept like pushing it back, pushing it back. Then they were like, 2013 has to be done. And then 2013 rolled around. They were like, okay, can I have a little bit more time? So like it was finally in May of 2019 that none of these foods is allowed to have more than a half a gram of trans fats per serving. Okay, and it was like a big thing. In fact, some people were like complaining that the cookies didn't taste the same. My Oreo cookies are not as good as they used to be. Oh, that's that is because they actually had to go back and retool recipes, not using shortening or margarine that ha contain trans fats. Now, the interesting thing is there is if you do an extra step in hydrogenation, you can avoid forming trans fats that costs more money. So that was what ended up happening is your hydrogenation companies actually had to change their processes so that you can get margarine that has no trans fats. 
It might have a small amount, but nowhere near what it used to have. So this is a benefit, benefit in terms of risk of heart disease, benefit in terms of overall health, especially for people that are like, they're busy, they don't have time to do the cooking, that like reach for more of the convenience foods types of things. That really is a big help. So now the only place that you're really going to encounter trans fats is if you eat anything that's been fried in oil where the oil stays hot for hours, like all day. Can you think of a place where they turn on a fryer and it stays hot all day? Yes. Fat, anything that's fried in a fast food. McDonald's, like the ones that are open 24 hours, they never turn the fryers off. So if you have oil with it's unsaturated and it's heated for hours and hours and hours, it will hydrogenate itself just because of the heat. Remember, energy speeds up reactions, so it'll hydrogenate. And in that hydrogenation, there are some trans fats that are formed. Oh, well. <laughs> just thought we'd share. <laughs> Huh? I know. I was like, well, you know, darned if you do, darned if you don't kind of thing. All right. So that's hydrogenation, though. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And like, I mean, I've been teaching all during this time and it was like super frustrating. I was like, but they just they just keep pushing this back. I was like in 20 in 2010, I was like in 2013, there will be no more. And I was like, never mind. <laughs> in 2015. And so in 2019, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. This is actually like a big change in the United States. And like, no no joke, Europe banned trans fats. Oh, yeah, like, they don't, I've been over there. Like, nothing. There's a lot of things that are banned over there. Yeah, but you the mean, United States still you goes, go, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll serve people that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, there's not as much bad stuff over there. It's very interesting. Like, it is. When I was in Ireland for two weeks, like, I had a bunch of potatoes and, like, stuff. <laughs> Yeah, they don't use as near the preservatives. A lot of the foods that are made are not like prepackaged stuff. So therefore, it doesn't have the added salt. So they add salt to food because it actually increases the flavor. They add sugar to things because it increases the sweetness. But it's all in that prepackage, so they don't do that. And that's why. <laughs> healthcare, healthcare, the booming business. Mm -hmm. It's really, and it's it's sort of like when you kind of like look around, if you look at other countries, there's a lot of differences. Like a lot of people just go and go to the grocery store and buy what they need for that day. They don't like go to Sam's. <laughs> and they're like, we're going home with like all of these frozen things, like pre-made stuff that all you're basically doing is heating up. Like that's just sort of like not the normal way. It's just an interesting thing. Last one. So here's the last one. Again, we're doing a... A breaking that double bond, hydrogenation and hydration, you're breaking a double bond. So in this one, and again, irritates the tire out of me, does not belong here, plus H2O. So here is one where water is a reactant. Remember I told you that in hydrolysis, water is a reactant. Hydration, water is a reactant. But hydrolysis splits a molecule. Here, hydration is just breaking the double bond. So we're actually breaking the double bond, adding an, uh, the hydrogen to one of the carbons, adding the alcohol to the other carbon. So it's almost the same, but it's not. No, in this, it's hydration. You're not breaking the molecule in half, like hydrolysis. So remember, hydrolysis, like you take these and then you end up with these two, right? So we add a hydrogen and an alcohol to split the molecule in half, like digestion. Hydration, we're taking one that's got the double bond, we're breaking the double bond, adding hydrogen to one, alcohol to the other. It's a lot like hydrogenation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So look, it looks a lot like hy the hydrogenation, but I'm just adding water instead of hydrogen. Okay? So in this, water is a reactant. I'm going to convert the double bond to a single bond. So you can see in this one, so there's an example. There's a three-carbon molecule with the double bond. The product is going to be a single bond, a hydrogen, and an alcohol group. So you'll always end up with an alcohol on it. So there was a Russian chemist guy that studied this like his entire life. So then after he died, they named like the, what always happens in the reaction, they named it Markovnikov. 
It's named after him. All right, so here's examples now. So you tell me, what's this one? I'm not going to ask you to complete a reaction, but I might show you a reaction, and you need to tell me which, of, which reaction is it. So it's going to be hydrolysis, condensation, hydration, or hydrogenation. Three H's, okay? So the big kicker is trying to keep straight which one's which. So what's that one? Hydration. We just talked about it, so hopefully you got that one. Right? Hydration, I add water and break a double bond. Okay? Hydration adds water, breaks the double bond. That's really like the best way to think about it. What about the next one? Hydrogenation. Mm -hmm. So here I'm adding hydrogen to break the double bond. I think of it as hydrogenation. Okay, so the word hydrogen, then Asian, like if you're trying to spell it right. Okay, now tell me, what's this one? Just notice I'm not breaking a double bond. Hmm? <laughs> so there is condensation, hydrolysis, hydration, hydrogenation. Condensation. So where's water and condensation? It's on the product side. So this is hydrolysis. I heard like hydrogelolysis. <laughs> <laughs> so this is hydrolysis. Water is a reactant. But notice I don't have a double bond. Can you see that this and this are the same? This and this are the same. So I took this molecule, split it in half by adding hydrogen to one end, alcohol to the other. So it's, when you look at it, you see like one molecule. Notice there's no double bond broken. That's another kicker that you're looking for. There's no double bond broken, but I end up with one bigger molecule makes two smaller molecules. This is like digestion. This is this breakdown from something bigger into something litter, littler using water. What's the bottom one? Nope. No, this, just because it's the fourth one, it's, <laughs> it's a trick question. Hmm? Nope. Nope. It's a hydration. Look, it looks just like the top one. Took a double bond, broke the double bond by adding water. Okay? So see the top one? These are both hydration. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're like, yeah, that's what it, by process of elimination, it has to be that. So here's the one where I'm not doing this one today. So this one's one I want you to do because it's a good one trying to identify. You can practice, does this have, is this oxidation or reduction? But here is this one. Ah. Okay, so remember it's the four. Condensation, hydrolysis, hydration, hydrogenation. It is not hydration. <laughs> it's hydrogenation, right? And so here's what you look for, right? So if I add hydrogen, see the double bond is gone. So I start with the double bond, then it's gone. So I know it's going to be hydration or, or hy sorry, hydration or hydrogenation. Since I added just H, this is hydrogenation. Okay. You had, if you had the banana lab yesterday, we kind of talked about this. This is a, the first one is a disaccharide, so that's sucrose or table sugar. In digestion, table sugar gets split into glucose and fructose. So what is this? It is hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. Hydrolysis. So follow the red. So see, water is a reactant. That's one thing. So in hydrolysis, water is a reactant. Hydrogen gets added to one molecule, the alcohol to the other molecule. So we're splitting it into two. So see how it's a disaccharide? Now it's two single sugars. So that's what happens in digestion. Remember we were talking about people that are lactose intolerant? So lactase does this to lactose. It takes glucose and galactose are linked, and that enzyme helps to speed up the breaking does hydrolysis to do it. 
So when you break molecules, you still, if you want to break a bond, you still have to add stuff to that bond to make the carbons or the oxygen stable. Okay, what about this one down at the bottom? <laughs> yes, it's hydrolysis. Okay, why? Because I added water, right? So water is, notice in the, the middle one and this bottom one, water is a reactant. I took this molecule and now I've split it into like two parts, okay? So the product looks kind of like the reactant, not the water, but the other reactant looks like it's now two. So this part is this part. This part is this part. Okay? So I split it by adding alcohol to one side, the hydrogen to the other side. Don't worry about this one. Just look at that. That's what it'll look like on a react in a reaction. hydration. Hmm. How do you know? I'm adding H2O, but I do that in hydrolysis. But what's the difference? Breaks the double bond. Hydration breaks the double bond. Hydrolysis splits a big molecule into two. Do you notice I didn't split the molecule? It's still one. So this one and this one, they're still like one big piece. It didn't split into two smaller. Yes, hydration breaks the double bond. Hydrolysis breaks the molecule into two pieces. Both of them are adding water. So if you see plus water, you know it's one of those, right? So if you something plus water, you're like, oh, this is hydrolysis or hydration. Look, if there's a double bond, it's hydration. If there's not a double bond, it's going to be hydrolysis. What about this one? It's hydrogenation, yes, right? So there is a little cyclopentene. I add hydrogen and convert it to a cyclopentane, okay? So you see that the molecule, all that happened was the double bond is gone, which means now I've had to add hydrogen to this. So this is hydrogenation. And now the last one. Hooray, right? Condensation you can pick out because water is a product. This is the only example where water is a product, right? So see how it's, I took two things, pulled hydrogen off of one side, the alcohol group off of the other, and that allowed them to merge. So it's like I took two pieces and put them together. These are those synthesis reactions. This is how you build stuff in the cell as you do condensation. All right. So Sunday, make sure you get your chemical reactions dynamic study module done. We've finished chapter five, so that's everything on there. M Tuesday, we start carbohydrates. We'll get finished through the carbohydrates next week. Water's on that side's condensation. Mm -hmm. Well, for these reactions, yes. <laughs> so it's on that half part of four, all of five, and we'll cover six next week. So the exam is not Tuesday. The exam is not until the following Tuesday. So I made that announcement in class. So exam three is March the 21st. Okay? I do have note cards if you want to start working on your note card or figuring out how you're going to organize it. So there's a couple of them up here if you want to pick them up. Thank you.